Now we're in the metastatic mode. We've kind of worked our way through adjuvant. So in the metastatic mode, Hussein, who gets tested and what do you test? Do you test BRAF in everybody? Do you test a big panel? Do you test a foundation panel? Do you do PDL1 testing? How do you test these patients and how does that help you? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, so our approach is to actually kind of, you know, cast the, the net as wide as possible because we need to strategize about metastatic patients. We're going to start with first-line therapy, which again could be on a clinical trial that may not be bio biomarker selective, but once they progress, most of our clinical trials in the PD-1 refractory setting are going to be biomarker selective. So we test um, a genomic panel that, that covers a wide range of genes, obviously with BRAF as well, uh, as a very important aspect of it for the next choice. Uh, we do test with IHC, we do test for PDL1 and for a few other markers that we find useful for choosing clinical trials after initial progression. But most of these tests in the first line setting are going to be centered around, again, knowing the BRAF status and whether we want to actually proceed with a combination that involves BRAF MEC versus. Uh, you know, PD-1 um, uh, therapy. So the more you know about your patient in that setting, the more you're likely to find better solutions for them if they do not respond to the first line setting. Right, so I would also say that we know from some of the data from Keynote 006 that the response rates to ipilimumab are somewhere around 10 to 15%. So you'll be looking for something down the line for your patients. And that's why I feel that we should be doing as much as we can to identify mutations that can be targeted. We have trials like DART, like TAPER, like MATCH that, are, that can bring those drugs that have shown efficacy in other solid tumors into the melanoma space, and those mutations do exist, although rare. The big question, of course, is the, you're, you've got your metastatic patient, you've, you've done your testing, they're, you've learned about pdl one although that may or may not be useful, but now you know that they're BRAF mutated. So the question is, what are you going to do with your BRAF mutated patient, Jason? Are you going to always treat him with a BRAF MEC combination? Are you never going to treat him with a BRAF MEC combination? What determines your decision as to whether you're going to give a mutated patient BRAF MEC combination or whether you're going to give him immunotherapy, whether it's mono or combo? Yeah. So uh, this has been a tough question for years, and uh, fortunately, I think this is the one area where our evolving landscape of therapeutics will make this question easier, because whatever you didn't give them adjuvant is probably going to be the answer for what you give them when they recur. So that, that will solve. We've been going round and round about this for a couple of years, but uh, if we'll just play it out and say that there was no adjuvant therapy, and then what do you do for this upfront mutated patient? And it, it's tough. I mean, I think um, there, there is a population of patients who have high volume disease, maybe brain meds, LDH, and there it seems fairly clear and we agree, most people agree it'd be Nevo if they can get is what to give them. But if you take your sort of standard patient with a reasonable LDH, not rapidly falling apart, and there's just great data for BRAF and MEC targeted therapy in those patients, and it looks very similar actually to the PD-1 monotherapy data. So then how do you choose? Well, I think you have this conversation that, you know, sort of, and really lay it out for the patient. What are the pros and cons of each of these approaches? Which of these fits your lifestyle better? Uh, coming to the doctor more often, less often, toxicities here, there, long-term side effects, these kinds of things. Because in this area, for that kind of patient, you know, for those of us, probably all of us here, the Kool-Aid drinkers, we think we can do really good things for that patient for a very long time. So how do we optimize that? Right? So these people are not likely to get sick from cancer in the relatively near future. So how do we set everything up so we'll have the most available pieces to move forward? So I don't have an absolute answer. Um, you know, some of it is driven by clinical trials, obviously, at big centers and such. But for an average patient, I think either choice could be reasonable. And Hussein, if you're going to make that choice, how long are you going to treat them for? Do we have, in fact, at this ASCO, we'll be hearing some data, I gather, correct? So, so uh, I guess your question relates to PD-1, but, but I would just say that for BRF, if you start BRF MEC uh, therapy, at this point there is no data to support stopping at some point. We continue those patients on treatment as long as they're responding. I would say most people would agree with you. Uh, for the uh, PD-1, uh, if we treat with single agent or with combination, I would say with combination therapy, most of the time we stop because the treatment makes us stop because we get toxicity from epinevo and almost half of the patients that make us want, you know, have to, to, to stop. And then if the patients have derived really great clinical responses, we might observe. Sometimes we might um, go back and, and put them back on single agent therapy. 
For single agent PD-1, obviously the depth of the response, the dynamics of the response, so a patient that I give the, the single agent no toxicity and three months later there's no tumor to be found or their tumor burden has decreased dramatically by 70 or 80 percent, those are patients that I would feel more comfortable in the short term by the time they finish, either finish one year of therapy or they achieve a complete response, which that can happen, I would consider stopping on those patients earlier. The current guideline or the current treatment is to go for a full two years of therapy. I find myself stopping a lot earlier for patients that are de deriving clinical benefit. Okay. And I think this data that you mentioned that's going to be presented supports this approach.